Welcome to the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association's Patients Come First podcast series. Podcast episodes are available on VHHA.com and on popular podcast hosting apps, including Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Spotify, and many others. We're a member of the Public Health Podcast Network, the Virginia Audio Collective, and the Family Podcast Network. Podcast episodes also air each Sunday at noon on 100.5 FM, 92.7 FM, and 820 AM across Central Virginia, 1650 AM in Hampton Roads, 105.1 105.1 FM and 1050 AM in Lynchburg, and Wednesdays at 1 PM on 93.9 FM in Richmond. Please send questions, comments, feedback, or guest suggestions to pcfpodcast at vhha.com. Again, that's pcfpodcast at vhha.com. And joining us today is Dr. Saad Hawk, a physician with VHC Health who specializes in gastroenterology and hepatology. Our conversation will cover how his pursuit of medical training brought him to the U.S., the importance of digestive and liver health, information about the VHC Health Digestive Center, and more. With that, welcome to the show, Dr. Hawk. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Julian. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here on the show with you. Well, the pleasure is ours, and we appreciate you making time and your busy schedule. So let's just jump right in. It's our custom to get these conversations rolling by learning more about our guests, What we know about you is that you earned your medical degree in Pakistan before coming to the United States for residency at Drexel University in Philadelphia and fellowship at Cooper University Hospital in New Jersey. You've worked at hospitals in Maryland and Virginia and are active in several specialty medical societies. You're also a family man. I'm sure those few details are just part of your unique personal story. So if you would, get us started by telling us more about yourself perhaps including a little bit about your experience coming to the United States and planting personal and professional roots. Absolutely. Yes, you're quite right. Um, uh, Born and raised in Pakistan. My father was a military officer, so we moved around a lot. That was part of my experience growing up. So when it came time to consider training after I finished medicine, the idea to move to another country to pursue further training was not that scary. Uh, I was quite actually open to it. So with that I attempted to get into a residency program, and then one thing led to another, and I really got to uh, like gastroenterology as a field um, and stayed in the Philadelphia, New Jersey area for subsequent training, being um, quite blessed to have a family. Um, I have a wife. Uh, We live actually in uh, Old Town, Alexandria. We really love the area. My parents visit often, so we spend time with them, and I have siblings, um, so we're very blessed in that respect. As far as myself, I'm very much into staying fit. I like to bike, um, road biking, essentially. I'm also a big fan of sports, watch all sorts of sports. So try to stay active, try to you know, be a good example for my family as well as my, for my patients. You mentioned your family, your parents and siblings. Just out of curiosity, do they still live in Pakistan or have they emigrated to the United States as well? Uh, they still live uh, in Pakistan. My brother um, is an engineer. He was a, he qualified from Texas. He finished his engineering degree in, in Texas, and he runs a solar company in Pakistan. He does very well. Uh, and then I have a sister. She's her own family. She's married. She actually lives in Thailand with her family. So, uh, and my parents, they live in Pakistan, so they do visit. I've tried to talk to them into <laughs> moving here, but they're quite happy with their uh you know, they've got friends and family, and, uh, you know, as we get older, I think these things, your routine, your independence, they become very, very important. So we visit them often, and they visit me, and we've tried to keep that relationship as strong as ever. That's great. Sounds like you've got folks all over the globe, which gives you an opportunity to travel. A moment ago, we mentioned that you specialize in gastroenterology, which is medicine focused on the digestive system, and hepatology, which involves care for the liver and related processing organs. We've had several liver specialists on this program in the past, and they've shared some insights about the role of those systems and their importance in the body. I wonder if you can share your perspective on that, Dr. Hawk. Yes, of course. So, liver disease um, is a chronic condition, unfortunately, in the U.S., and it's a very serious entity because the liver keeps our bodies clean. It constantly filters out all sorts of toxins, keep our immune system working appropriately, and it helps digest food. It has so many different functions, but I'm just scratching the surface when I say what I just said. 
And unfortunately, because of the way the liver is, it's exposed to all sorts of when we are not very careful with our lifestyle. It is very easily affected, unfortunately, by, uh, as we know, by alcohol and even the quality and type of food we eat. And of course, how active we stay. The worst part about this is this is a very slow uh, disease and it has no major symptoms early on when it comes to the liver. So we are sort of not really made aware of these the consequences of these actions and lifestyle uh, modifications until it's very late. Uh, and that is a huge issue in the United States because we have a pandemic. It's a disease called the fatty liver disease of the liver, and it is affecting almost one in three uh, adults in the country. So the worst part is, as I said, most people are not aware that they have this condition. Usually we come to, you know, we come to talk to these patients when they've been referred for some other condition. And during the course of the investigation, we find out their labs and ultrasound look a certain way. And then before you know it, they have this uh, diagnosis, unfortunately. And that actually is a great segue to the next question. And you covered some of the ground that we're going to cover there, but I think there's still more room for for conversation. We are recording with Dr. Hawk in late September, which is just before October, which is National Liver Awareness Month. It's a time where people are encouraged to learn more about liver health and liver function. The liver helps break down food and nutrients and store energy, as Dr. Hawk just said, and fight infections and clean the blood. Data also tells us, which Dr. Hawk mentioned, that millions of Americans have fatty liver disease and liver cirrhosis is one of the leading causes of death in the U.S. This organ is very important to overall health. So you talked a little bit about things like avoiding alcohol, being active and physically fit, the diet that that you have and the food you ingest. Beyond those tips, are there other recommendations you would share for liver health? And you also noted that some of the detection of liver disease, because it doesn't demonstrate a lot of obvious symptoms, comes later. Is there any suggestion or guidance you would offer about health screenings, perhaps earlier, to detect a condition with the liver? Of course. To answer the first part of the question, which was, what are the other things other than lifestyle modification we can do to help with liver disease? Uh, unfortunately, this is the only thing we can do because ultimately how active we are, um, the amount of processed food we eat, the amount of alcohol we consume, and generally other things like smoking and so forth, these are the three or four different factors which ultimately can essentially cause liver disease. Of course, there are other people who may have infections and so forth of the liver, which has nothing to do with any of this. But when it comes to metabolic health, which is where fatty liver disease comes from, these are the three or four major determinants that we can actually change. Uh, Other factors that we are unable to change, for example, genetic factors like having family members with diabetes um, and other high cholesterol related conditions like heart disease, et cetera, should be red flags to patients to speak to their doctor and say, hey, you know, I have this condition where uh, my parents uh, had this condition where they were diabetic. And at some point, I know that diabetic patients are more likely to have liver problems. So can I be please uh, screened for fatty liver disease? Is that something that's applicable? And I'm sure their healthcare provider would probably do something along those lines. But yes, other than these three or four modifiable parameters, there's really not much else. And however we slice this, whether it's for cardiac health, gut health, liver health, it's always these three or four things. So I wish I could tell you there's a, a pill for something like this, but you know, and actually we do have a pill for fatty liver disease that just was released recently, but in the larger scheme of things, if one can focus on these three or four things, not only are you going to have great liver health, but you're also going to have great cardiovascular health. Your risk for uh, malignancies, cancers of all sorts goes down. So it's the one elixir of youth, I would say, if one is to stick to a good lifestyle, it can cure all. Well, that is good advice that 
You're responsible for your own health. You've got one body, so use it appropriately and take care of it. So great advice there. Another organ that is an important component of the body's digestive system is the colon. In recent years, experts have noted a 15% increase in colon cancer diagnoses in adults ages 18 to 50, which has led to recommendations that patients begin to screen for colon cancer at ages even earlier than before, when it might have been 50, now it's more like 45 or earlier, even at 40. I know colorectal surgery is one of the treatments offered at the VHC Health Digestive Center. So with that data in mind, what do you tell your patients about steps or behaviors to help reduce their risk of colon cancer? Yes, uh, you're quite right, Julian, that starting age 45, we have come up with guidelines which ask patients to be screened for colon cancer. Previously, as you mentioned, it used to be age 50. Uh, The reason why this threshold was lowered was because we found a significantly increased number of patients with colon cancer in the 40 to 50 year old age group. And thus we had to, in you know, the greater good for the public, we had to decrease the um, recommendations to start at age 45. Now, again, what are the factors that can lead to colon cancer, early colon cancer in particular? We obviously know that genetics plays a role. So if there are family members who may have had a history of colon cancer, colon polyps, et cetera, this increases one's chances for being diagnosed with colon cancer. In fact, this is one of the highest risk factors. So please make sure that you ask all family members, especially if they've you know, had issues with their GI tract, was there ever a history for colon cancer or colon polyps? This is very important. In fact, if a patient, you know, if patients with colon polyps are listening, it is their responsibility and their duty to tell all first degree relatives that, hey, I had polyps removed, you know, since you're my brother, father, sister, please make sure that you get screened also. So that's right off the bat, that's probably very important. Other things that you should be aware of are back to those same three or four factors we talked about for liver health. Uh, How active is one person? Are you able to get a certain number of steps, 8,000, 1,000 steps, whatever the number may be based on your health and age? please make sure you stay active. This does not necessarily mean going to the gym. It just means that you incorporate activities during your natural day-to-day activity, like making sure you take the stairs, making sure you park a little further away from the grocery store than necessary and and walk across. Small things like that. These don't sound like a lot. These do not require expensive gym memberships, but they get you there. Other things include making sure you decrease or avoid alcohol as much as possible. Alcohol is associated with colon cancer, as is smoking. Uh, And lastly, the more processed our food is, the higher the risk for colon cancer. So uh, imagine, if you will, uh, the Mediterranean diet, high in unsaturated fats, things like olive oil, fresh fruit and vegetables, seasonal fruit and vegetables, chicken, fish, things like that. These are the things which will help decrease the risk for colon cancer, not only colon cancer, but also, as we discussed, uh, liver cancer and liver disease. I think you raised a great point there. Obviously, the healthy behaviors, eating right, getting activity, avoiding unhealthy things like excessive alcohol consumption, smoking and tobacco use. But one point you made that I think really registers with me is this idea of sharing about and not being afraid to share and being proactive about sharing information uh, if you have a family history or if you've, as you said, been diagnosed and had polyps removed, telling the people in your circle, in your in your family, so that they might get checked as well. I think that's really good advice. So I appreciate you sharing that. want to transition. We've talked a little bit about the VHC Digestive Health Center in Fairfax, which offers a wide range of services to patients, including treatment for digestive ailments such as acid reflux, surgical care for colorectal cancer, which we just mentioned, bowel conditions, minimally invasive procedures, to help with weight loss and obesity disorders. 
the impression I have is that the goal of the center is to deliver high quality GI care to patients with a particular focus on reaching underserved populations like the uninsured or underinsured. With that background on the center, tell us some of, about some of the initiatives of the facility and how they are making a difference for patients. Yes. So the VHC Digestive Health Center in Merrifield, Virginia, is something that we are very proud of. It's an initiative, as you mentioned, that is primarily there to increase access for our community, for our patients, because gut health is something that is becoming more and more of an issue, um, and there are multiple reasons behind that. And certainly in this part of Virginia, it is a significantly it's a subspecialty that's in significantly uh, short supply. Uh, there's a lot of deficiencies there. So we're really trying to overcome uh, that deficiency. And more importantly, um, the other aspect behind this initiative is to provide personalized care, which involves multiple different specialties that all focus on gut health in one way or the other. For example, we have gastroenterologists, we have surgeons from that cover different parts of the GI tract. We have dietitians and so forth, all working within one under one roof. Uh, the reason behind coming up with this initiative is that we often have situations where a gastroenterologist feels like this person should have surgery, but then they ask the patient to see the surgeon and then the referral doesn't come through and the surgeon doesn't get all the information. And, and there are a lot of lip, slips, as they say, between the lip and the cup. The idea was, what if we could combine all of this and bring it under one roof where we all the physicians, all the providers are sharing the same information and the patient can be you know, rest assured that all his care providers are on the same page. So whenever a certain referral is provided or a certain diagnosis is made, all the physicians work as a team without any knowledge gaps and misunderstandings and things work faster the things are safer and diagnoses can be made much quicker and this all works out to the patient's advantage. Well, I appreciate that overview and certainly for folks who live in the Northern Virginia area who want to potentially avail themselves of the services offered at the VHC Digestive Health Center, certainly encourage you to look that facility up uh, and contact them if you are in need of digestive health services. Dr. Hawk, we are coming close to the end of our time, and I want to say thank you again for sharing so much great information with us today. Before we wrap up, we do have a tradition on this podcast to close things out by asking our guests a pair of surprise questions. To keep things interesting, we have a list of 10 mystery questions that you can choose from. So when you're ready, please give me two numbers between 1 and 10, and I will give you the corresponding questions. Okay, uh, nine and three. Okay. Do you want them in that order or do you want to go in numerical order? Uh, we could go in numerical order. How okay. about that? All right. Well, then we'll start with number three, which is what is the best piece of advice you've ever received and why does it stick with you? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I think the best piece of advice I ever got was from my father. He told me that life is, is a combination of holding on and letting go. And this is beautiful for me because I realize that every stage of life has its responsibilities and its advantages. But then as that stage comes to an end and you move to the next stage, you have to change. You have to accept that those things that were very relevant at that stage should not be allowed to move forward to the next stage. So you have to let go of certain things so that you make room in your life for what is to come. So I've tried to remember that as I move through life, and I think it has worked for me to some extent, and that's why I would like to share that with you. Well, I appreciate you sharing that because that's a great piece of advice, and I'm going to hold on to that and, and remember that and not let go of it. So thank you for sharing sure. that. And then you also selected number nine, and that question is, if you were miraculously granted one wish, what would you wish for? I would seriously wish for world peace at this point because i think there's so many conflicts that are dragging on around the world uh, and they're very very sad very hard to uh, come across and read about every day 
And it's, it's just very painful to read and see this in the news. And I just feel like there's no end in sight. I know we're talking about things other than medicine and so forth, but yes, that is one thing I would wish for that we could just stop for maybe just a few days and just let everybody be and just kind of experience peace true peace around the world for a few days. And then I'm sure nobody would ever want to go back to how things were. Yeah, no, that's, that's great perspective. And listen, I think it is related to healthcare, regardless of where one is ideologically, philosophically, politically, I think there can be universal recognition that when there is conflict, when there is violence, when there is war or combat, that means that lives are lost and bodies are injured and scarred. And so irrespective of which side those losses are occurring on, it's still a tragic loss of human life. It's still a loss of function. It's still a loss of family. So great sentiment there. Appreciate you sharing that. And Dr. Hawk, with that, that brings us to the close of another episode of the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association's Patients Come First podcast. If you like what you heard, please make sure to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and subscribe so that you know when new episodes are available. And again, we want to thank our guest, Dr. Saad Hawk with VHC Health for joining us today. So thank you, sir. Thank you. It was a pleasure being here, Julian. Thank you.